No serious examination of the problem of peace can avoid its moral and cultural dimensions. That political, economic, and other factors can strongly influence human behavior does not excuse us from considering that character shapes human conduct, character. Only by examining in depth the basic moral terms of human existence is it possible really to understand how conflict might be averted. It is not possible for me here to set forth the philosophical basis for what I'm about to argue. I've done it at length in writing. Let me note that in exploring the issue of morality, we must resist intellectual myopia and presentism and repair to the historical experience of mankind. This means questioning the most common modern Western view, often called liberal, that moral values are merely subjective or the postmodernist notion that moral beliefs are but the idiosyncratic creatures of historical circumstance. If we think more historically and internationally, a rather different notion of morality emerges. Amidst a great variety of beliefs, we discern a shared sense of higher values. The ancient Greeks called them the good, the true, and the beautiful, of which moral good was assumed to have primacy. In the great civilizations and moral and religious systems of the world, ecumenical research discerns a far-reaching transcultural and transhistorical agreement on what, is central, on what is the central problem of human existence. Namely, that the human will is cleft between higher and lower potentialities and that man is his own worst enemy. National arrogance and economic ruthlessness are direct and palpable threats to international harmony. But they are only instances of the more general danger that societies and peoples instead of interacting on the level of what is more morally, aesthetically, and intellectually noblest in each, will interact at their worst, when most self-absorbed and grasping. Enlightened self-interest may keep the parties from clashing, but it will form no stable and lasting basis for peace. That popular Western culture is today spreading around the world creates a kind of commonality among peoples. But that culture is almost uniformly disdainful of the moral and cultural traditions of mankind. For that reason, and because of its crudities and vulgarities, it does not create any real bond among the more discriminating people in the world. To the extent that peoples and civilizations display their least admirable characteristics, closer contact may result in their recoiling from each other in distaste, a reaction that may be exploited by opportunists who look for ways to exercise their will to power. People looking to alleviate conflict must face the difficulty that the higher life of humanity is forever threatened by every type of human self-indulgence, by partisan passion, arbitrariness, ruthlessness, cruelty, ignorance, short-sightedness, and that importunate will to power. The main obstacle to harmonious relations among individuals and groups is the flawed character of man himself. Frequently, historical and social circumstances aggravate man's troubles, but the fundamental problem is that human beings tend to shrink from the necessary moral effort weak of will as they are, and prone to less commendable desires. In proportion as the members of a society fall short of their highest standards, the highest standards of their own society, they undermine not only their own happiness and the cohesion of their society, but international relations. In the end, only moral character can fortify the self in man that wants goodness, truth, and beauty. This kind of progress requires protracted exertions. The central purpose of civilization is to assist individuals in reining in their least admirable traits 
so that their more admirable ones can be developed. The belief that human beings are torn between desires that enhance existence and ones that, though they bring short-term pleasure, are destructive of a deeper meaning was, until the last century or two, taken for granted in the Western world, as it was in the East. To realize the goal that the ancient Greeks called eudaimonia, happiness, the person must learn to discipline his appetites of the moment, try to extinguish some of them with a view to his own enduring higher good. Happiness does not refer to a maximization of pleasure. It refers to the special sense of well-being and self-respect that attends living nobly and responsibly. It is for the sake of this life that persons forego momentary pleasures and advantages. The good life has many aspects and prerequisites, moral, intellectual, aesthetical, political, and economic, but there was widespread agreement in the old Western society, whether Greek, Roman, or Christian, that realizing life's higher potential ultimately depends on the person's character, quality of will, the greatest danger to genuine fulfillment is giving in to the pleasure of what threatens good. A person who lacks the strength to act rightly cannot achieve happiness by dint of intellectual brilliance, imaginative power, or economic productivity. According to the old Western tradition and corresponding traditions in the East, society should encourage the kind of working on self that will in time build meaning and worth into personal and social existence. Whether the goal is the happiness and nobility of a worldly life that Aristotle and Confucius advocate, or the special piece of holiness in which religion culminates, there is no substitute for protracted, sometimes difficult effort of will. Note carefully that the most basic measure of progress is the quality of actions performed. Quote, I am the way and the life and the truth, said Jesus of Nazareth. Implied is that this claim could be validated only in practical action. In Buddhism, the right way is the diligent working on self to extinguish needless or destructive desires. In the Dhammapada, which is attributed in its general spirit to the Buddha, we read about the path to nirvana, and I quote, you yourself must make an effort, unquote. In the West, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who died in 1778, issued the most radical and influential challenge to this view of human nature. Rousseau was, among other things, the main intellectual inspiration for the French Jacobins, who spearheaded the French Revolution of 1789. For Rousseau, the old view of human nature just described is profoundly mistaken. Man is not chronically torn between good and evil. There are in man himself no lower inclinations, certainly no original sin, as Christianity alleges. Man was born good. In his primitive, pre-social, natural state, man was pure, simple, peaceful, and happy. And that remains his nature. The evil in the world is due not to some perversity in man, but to perverse social norms and institutions. Destroy that society and goodness will flow. <coughs> Rousseau and his many followers pioneered a revolution in the Western understanding of morality. To summarize the change, virtue ceased to be a matter of character and right willing. It became a state of feeling and imagination, an attribute of the heart. The old measure of moral goodness was responsible action. The new measure was tearful empathy. Pity. No longer was virtue thought to result from sometimes painful, painful self-scrutiny and a diligent working on self. 
Man being good by nature, there was no need for man to be on guard against his own lower impulses or to discipline self. Neither was there any need for traditional norms or for social groups and institutions to buttress morality. It was by, it was by liberating man from such constraints that natural goodness would reassert itself. Rousseau and his followers shifted the central struggle of human existence from the inner life of persons to the social and political arena where the virtuous had to defeat evil forces. Rousseau's redefinition of morality, which by itself had a profound influence in the modern Western world, coincided historically with a kind of rationalism that seized the initiative with the Enlightenment. Its conception of reason was heavily slanted in the direction of natural science and mathematics. The representatives of the Enlightenment rejected the traditional view of man as unscientific. They had no place for ancient moral wisdom. A better life did not require moral character, but a fundamental restructuring of society according to scientific insight. Rousseauistic sentimental idealism and enlightenment rationalism might seem to be wholly different approaches to life, but they became close and frequent allies. Both abandoned the idea of the, mora of the morally divided self and belittled the need for moral self-discipline and self-improvement. Selfishness, ruthlessness, avarice, and conflict were not due to any permanent human weakness, but could be overcome by remaking the social and political exterior. Sentimental idealism and rationalism came together in social engineering. In the area of international relations, the blending of sentimental virtue and technocratic thinking has fostered the vision of a unitary, enlightened, and vaguely egalitarian global culture, often summarized in the term democracy. The historically evolved distinctiveness of people, societies, and civilizations should yield to an ideologically correct homogeneity. But this rather common notion of global unity evades the moral and cultural issues previously discussed and may be positively destructive of good relations. Equally questionable is the notion that persons, societies, and civilizations should give up their distinctiveness. Let me suggest that what the world actually needs is a type of cosmopolitanism that does not fear but cherish historically evolved identities. The cosmopolitanism I advocate encourages particular persons, societies, and civilizations to be themselves while living up to their own highest standards. This cosmopolitanism affirms both cultural distinctiveness and pan-cultural unity, each understood as anchored in the same moral striving. To be conducive to peace, political, economic, scientific, and other efforts to reduce conflict have to be informed by moral realism, that is, by recognition of the need for self-control and corresponding cultural sensibility. I call this approach to peace cosmopolitan humanism. I hasten to add that cultural diversity can manifest egotism. Provincialism, decadence, and brutality and cause conflict. Diversity that is not humanized by morality but manifests arbitrary willfulness or eccentricity is a source of friction and instability. Nationalistic self-absorption absorption and arrogance caused terrible suffering in the last two centuries. The great problem with what is ordinarily called multiculturalism is that it is quite unable to distinguish between diversity that ennobles and diversity that degrades human life. Most po postmodernists, for their part, simply reject the distinction between good and bad. 
Many of them advocate a more playful approach to life, as they call it. They should consider that children are taught not to play with matches. The history of a people is the source of its social cohesion, outlook on life, and sense of self-worth. The past shapes it in countless ways, some of which are not even visible to the superficial eye. Every people has less than admirable traits of which it would do well to try to divest itself. But it also cannot give its best without being itself. The greatest achievements of a people must be absorbed anew by each generation and be made relevant to changed circumstances. For a people's creative efforts in the present to be more than a me mechanical and artificial imitation of alien patterns, they need to be adapted to the people's historically evolved cultural identity. When people in different societies cultivate what is most admirable in their culture, they are at one and the same time cultivating their own heritage and the common human ground of goodness, truth, and beauty. In culturally enriching their own society, they are deepening their ties to other people. Cosmopolitan humanism recognizes that many distinctive historically formed cultural identities can manifest one and the same higher striving, more or less successfully in particular cases. Representatives of different cultures can come together as fellow human beings, not despite, but through their cultural individuality inspired as it is by the common human ground. Cosmopolitan humanism then simultaneously and indistinguishably cherishes the unity of purpose that is intrinsic to pursuing life's highest potential and the diversity that must characterize attempts to realize that potential. Moral and cultural activity, at their best, affirm the unity by harmonizing and dignifying the diversity, and affirm the diversity by varying and enriching the unity. This humanizing discipline thus has nothing to do with trying to replace particularity with an abstract or sentimental universalism. In the Western world especially, it is widely assumed that a culture of enlightenment and modern ideology will in time supplant the ancient traditions of the world. A great problem is that supposed progressives do not realize the extent to which social and political conditions that they take for granted, such as the rule of law, freedom, and tolerance, depend on personality traits that were fostered not by their own view of human nature and society, but by the old moral and cultural traditions that they deem unacceptable or expendable. Their plans for society and the world are largely parasitic on lingering character traits that they have no plans for preserving. They want behaviors of a certain kind, but without attending to their moral and cultural preconditions. If the ancient moral and religious traditions contain any truth about human nature, the technocratic or sentimental mind dangerously ignores the greatest threat to domestic and international peace, that man is his worst enemy. Peace can be achieved only through difficult and protracted moral and cultural effort. The members of society, and especially its leaders, must learn to resist the self-indulgence that puts them in conflict with others. They must be habituated to scrutinizing their own motives. The effort to humanize existence has many aspects, intellectual, aesthetical, political, economic, and so on, but they ultimately depend on the individual struggle with self. Sociopolitical arrangements can aid but not take the place of moral striving. Because historical circumstances vary so greatly, 
societies are bound to differ in how they approach and express respect for higher values. Yet, as previously discussed, there is among the ancient civilizations of the world a confluence of moral and cultural sensibility of great significance. Sorry, the, the master needs to go. Um, I'll do one show before you wrap it up. Yes, I will. Okay, thanks. Of particular relevance in the discussion of prospects for cordial relations is the belief that an exemplary person exhibits self-restraint and humility. The theme has been as pervasive in the East as in the West. The ancient Greeks warned against hubris, against the arrogant belief that you are one of the gods. For Christianity, the greatest sin is pride. Our primary moral ob obligation is not condemning the weaknesses of others and asking them to change, but diligently to attend to our own weaknesses. Christianity roundly condemns the conceit and moral evasiveness of finding fault in others. In the words of Jesus of Nazareth, quote, take the log out of your own eye first, and then you will be able to see and take the speck out of your brother's eye, unquote. It should be clear, then, that the notion of universality that I associate with cosmopolitan humanism contains no implication that persons, peoples, and civilizations should conform to a single model of life, or that this universality can be imposed by means of political engineering. It may be helpful to contrast this notion with a type of universalism that is particularly influential in the United States. I'm referring to an ideologically intense variant of the enlightenment mindset that has been already discussed. It assumes that a single political system is mandatory for all societies and that it should be everywhere installed through military means if necessary. I call this ideology the new Jacobinism. The French Jacobins wanted France to be the redeemer of nations. The new Jacobins have anointed the United States. It's important to understand how radically this form of universalism departs from the older Western tradition. An example may be useful. Although proximate in time, the ideas behind the US Constitution of 1789 and those behind the French Revolution of the same year are fundamentally different. The framers of the Constitution held a view of human nature and society that was essentially Christian, whereas the Jacobins were inspired by Rousseau. For Christians, moral virtue is indistinguishable from personal character. It is first of all a form of self-rule. It is the fruit of learning to subdue and order the passions. Jacobin virtue, by contrast, is primarily and directly political. It is a sense of moral superiority, of being a benefactor of mankind. Because it thinks of itself as a desire to improve the lives of others, this virtue feels itself entitled to the power needed to change the world. This virtue, then, is not a wish to control and improve self, but a wish to control and improve others. Far from having the effect of curbing the will to power, Jacobin universalism stimulates it. The central purpose of the US Constitution, by contrast, is to restrain power that of the people as well as that of their representatives. America's leaders were not interested in ideological crusading. They hoped to set a good example for others not to impose their will on them. The new Jacobins radically reinterpret what they call America's founding principles as belonging to all mankind and as justifying armed American global hegemony. And I'm coming down towards my conclusion. The U.S. Constitution granted the central government only limited and shared sovereignty. It left power for the most part in state and local institutions, and above all with the people themselves in their private capacities. The aim of the constitutional arrangements was unity in diversity. The union of states would help harmonize and draw strength from diversity, not abolish it. The neo-Jacobin fondness for abstract homogeneity and neglect of historical particularity runs counter to old American attitudes and Western traditions. 
in practice as well as theory, ideological universalism means a lack of respect for regional and local diversity and for the special needs and opportunities associated with them. It does not follow that multiculturalism in its most common form or, or postmodern historicism offer a humane alternative. Granted, we must, as I've argued, recognize the variety of human existence and its inevitable, inevitably contextual and contingent character. But postmodernism turns even history into a meaningless notion by its frantic and therefore disingenuous denial of universality. Without a unity or continuity of human experience, no consciousness could exist. There could be no history, only disjointed and therefore meaningless fragments. Postmodernist shares, or postmodernism shares with anti-historicist universalism the assumption that universality and particularity are incongruous. The postmodernists attack universality in the name of radical historicity. The new Jacobins attack historically evolved cultural identities in the name of ideological universality. Neither side recognizes the possibility of synthesis of universality and particularity. The dialectical and synthetical relationship of universality and particularity may be suggested in the most general terms. The good, the true, and the beautiful do, in a sense, lack specific form. They are magnetic qualities that an infinite number of still unfinished moral acts, philosophical thoughts, and works of art may have. But the good, the true, and the beautiful do, in a different sense, exist in particulars. They have been embodied in countless acts, thoughts, and works of art, in loving, morally responsible behavior, wise books and lectures, outstanding poets and compositions, which come alive in the present as they inspire more of the same. Genuine universality, then, is not an ahistorical, abstract standard of unity. It enriches and deepens existence in concrete, historical, particular ways. Universality can have no single form. Its only opportunity for articulation are the diverse circumstances of time and place. It is by expressing universal values in their own historical situation that persons, peoples, or civilization contribute to the higher life of humanity. This is another way of saying that true universality is inimical to a global uniculture. The truly common human ground does not emerge by abandoning that which is distinctive to persons, peoples, or civilizations, but on the contrary, by letting the distinctive become the vehicle for goodness, truth, and beauty. The proper cultivation of what is unique to the subdivisions of mankind harmonizes diversity. Moving towards a more than flimsy and transitory unity is not just compatible with people and civilizations cultivating their selfhood, selfhood at the highest level. It is the same thing. Unity is achieved through diversity. And since there seems to be time pressure, I will conclude there.